Welcome everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us today. My name is Tim Baker and I'll be moderating today's webinar on behalf of our host, Be Mary Ur. The title of this presentation is Integrating PCT Testing to Expedite Therapy for ED and ICU Patients. On behalf of Be Mary Ur, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today to explore this topic. It's our pleasure to introduce the expert leading this session, Dr. Mark Alterman. Dr. Altman is Director of the Medical ICU at John Peter Smith Hospital, a 430-bed Level 1 Trauma Center in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Altman manages four full-time intensivists at the hospital, which is home to the country's largest family practice residency. He recently became Vice Chairman of the Department of Internal Medicine and is responsible for quality for the department. As a primary hospital within the Tarrant County region, the John Peter Smith ICU sees many indigent patients who are often very ill. Most of these patients enter the hospital through the emergency department. Using case studies, Dr. Altman will discuss integrating PCT testing between the emergency department and ICU in order to quickly assess the risk of sepsis in these patients and to accelerate therapy. This discussion is based on Dr. Altman's extensive clinical experience. Dr. Altman will spend the next 40 minutes exploring how PCT can be used to improve the diagnosis and treatment of patients with suspected sepsis and to help stratify risk for patients with sepsis. We aim in our webinars for them to be highly interactive, so we have allowed time for questions and discussion following this presentation. We invite you and we encourage you to participate via the questions text bar on the right-hand side of your screen or through the dial-in option that our operator will describe at the end of the call. Dr. Altman is here to answer your questions and share his insights, so please don't hesitate to submit your questions or dial in to speak to him directly. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Altman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be invited to do this session. Uh, I have a particular passion for sepsis in the ICU. Just a couple of points of disclosure. This is an industry-sponsored meeting. I don't think there's any CME credits for anybody, but more specifically from my standpoint, I'm required to say that I'm not here representing JPS Hospital District in any, any fashion or JPS physician group that I work for. Just as a little bit of background, I do work as a full-time intensive care unit physician, primarily in the medical ICU. you will see a few surgical patients, but most of it's medical ICU. And the bottom line is sepsis is probably our number one major diagnosis that we have to deal with. There is an FDA claim for procalcitonin. I was unaware of this and so I started doing talks that lab tests need FDA approval also but it's approved to use in conjunction with the rest of your clinical assessment and other basic laboratory findings to try to describe the risk assessment of a critically ill patient on their first 24 hours of ICU admission, and will they continue to go to septic shock or severe sepsis. Goals for today are to discuss the use of biomarkers in general and procalcitonin in specific for the risk assessment of sepsis in patients that are ultimately destined for the intensive care unit level of care. There is additional data that talks about utilizing biomarkers and procalcitonin for ED decisions as far as whether you're going to send the patients home versus admit them. Some very good prospective data looking at whether or not you're going to give patients antibiotics when they come in, but I primarily want to concentrate on the emergency room ICU interaction and then look at some of the trending data there is for ICU patients once they get there. This is just a picture of the amino acid sequence of procalcitonin, and I think the takeaway message here is that it's a pro-hormone, and the darker blue in the center is calcitonin that gets cleaved in the C-cells of the thyroid gland to help you with calcium metabolism. So in the normal thyroid, the procalcitonin is produced as a pro-hormone, and the appropriate enzyme can cleave that, and then calcitonin can come out for calcium metabolism. But during bacterial infection specifically, multiple other organs are stimulated to produce procalcitonin. Specifically, by bacterial infections, you can see down here lower that viral infections and interferon gamma inhibit this production. But the point is, is that because these cells don't have the enzyme to cleave it, it comes out as a total protein sequence of procalcitonin. This is just a blot diagram of the normal scenario in healthy patients where procalcitonin is mostly produced in the thyroid and a little bit in the lung. And then during severe bacterial infection, essentially all the tissues of the body produce procalcitonin in its entire molecule. This is just a graphic showing the time course of procalcitonin compared to some of the other potential biomarkers. So you can see that interleukin-6, interleukin-10, tumor necrosis factor often rise very quickly. One of the problems with them is, as far as looking at them for biomarkers is they also decrease very, very rapidly. So depending on when the patients come in, they may have been missed. Procalcitonin begins to peak at about two to three hours and reaches its 
maximum at about 24 to 36 hours, and then if there's no longer any more major bacterial stimulation, it starts decreasing rapidly. That's in contradistinction to C-reactive protein that starts up a little bit later and then often stays elevated longer even though there's no more major bacterial stimulation. The nice thing about procalcitonin is that the higher levels tend to correlate with more severe infection. So just to kind of give you an idea of some of the numbers that we're discussing, normal is felt to be less than 0.05 for healthy individuals. Above 0.5 is felt to be abnormal. And then the higher it goes, the more likely they have severe sepsis and septic shock. When we look at some of the literature, some of the numbers that are being utilized is right around one nanograms per milliliter. So if you sort of remember that number, that's sort of some of the cutoffs when looking at the literature for severe infection. So this is an article that John Marshall published in 2009, and he presented some of this at the last critical care meeting in January, but talking about biomarkers in general for sepsis. And although he touched on procalcitonin and others, this was not a talk specifically about procalcitonin. But one of his comments were that, number one, biomarkers are very commonly used in other diseases. We're used to using them. We're supposed to be using them for clinical decision-making in many clinical institutions and situations. So we use D-dimer. We'll utilize BNP cardiac enzymes, et cetera. The other issue is that diagnosis of sepsis is very nonspecific. So as you know, the definition basically is at least two SERS criteria and suspect infection. And especially in the medical intensive care unit, infection being one of our most common diagnoses, it makes it very, very hard to distinguish those who have SERS from infection versus not. So you guys are familiar with the four SERS criteria that can be very nonspecific. And then the other issue is that clinically we're not very good at making the diagnosis of sepsis, and I'm going to show you some of that data. One of the other points is sepsis is one of our most treatable diseases. And when I say treatable, one of the things I'm talking about is the fact that if we do it well, if we do optimal care, there's a huge difference in outcome of patients as opposed if we're a little bit on the sloppy side and don't do it as well as we should. So some of their other comments about myomarkers is that it's an objective test, so it's not left to physician discretion in helping to find a normal homeostasis or whether the patient's improving. That gives us a reference where when patients are abnormal or is there some pathologic process going along or is the patient worse today. And the idea is that it has this objective lab test and gives has the capacity to add timely information that's not readily available from routine physiologic data that you're getting down in the emergency room or from your clinical exam. Now, I think it's important to note, though, is that biomarkers or monitors in of themselves don't change outcome. There has to be a change in therapy that's going to be tied to whatever monitor you use, biomarker or whatever, in order to improve outcome with patients. So we need to keep that in mind that it's not the biomarker itself, it's the biomarker has caused an alteration in your therapy. So they looked at a number of different biomarkers. There's over 100 of them that have been looked at, proposed, and studied to help us in sepsis. Many of them are the normal or the adaptive response to sepsis, so interleukins, et cetera. CRP probably has been most used widely to date, but I think procalcitonin is getting in better data. So one of the questions asked to me just last month is, well, do we really need another biomarker that's just going to be abused? You know, it's just one of those that gets ordered all the time. And uh, to be honest, I, I think procalcitonin is not likely to necessarily replace other lab tests. Now, maybe you could use it to replace C-reactor protein, but I'm going to try to show you some data that I think that's still helpful to have both of them. Biomarkers are not intended to replace your thinking. They're supposed to supplement your thinking. So anytime we have a biomarker, we should be thinking in terms of a pretest probability of sepsis, and then we use a biomarker to help that, and we come up with a post-test probability of sepsis. I think thirdly, just because a test is abused doesn't mean it's a bad test. Finally, I think, again, how good are we clinically at making a diagnosis of sepsis? In other words, if we were already 95% at making a diagnosis of sepsis, maybe it's not very helpful. Well, this is a couple of articles that sort of talk about the current reliability of our ability to make sepsis diagnosis. So the first article from the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine in 2001 basically said that physicians are only correct about 77% of the time. And as more recently, we haven't gotten any better. So in, in this more recent article from 2010, physician judgment of sepsis was correct only 73% of the time. The question is, would you really buy a car that only started seven or eight times out of ten? If you guys have been listening to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement webinars lately, they've started the one on intensive care unit. Terry Clemmer gave an excellent introductory lecture talking about reliability in medicine. And his comment would always be, you know, would we fly on an airplane that two out of ten times crashed? So I think we have to see the need for biomarkers in this disease. So in the article by John Marshall, they described these five different areas for the potential use of biomarkers. And procalcitonin may or may not fit in any or all of these, but again, I think we want to go through them one by one and talk about the different possibilities. 
So the first one is screening, so identifying high-risk patients for early therapy but perceived low risk of sepsis. So patients that will be relatively sick and high risk for poor outcomes, but you're really thinking their primary diagnosis is something else. So I think the patients that come to mind in this area, we get one or two of these a month. A patient comes in, is unstable. They're thought to be a cardiac patient. Maybe they have a left bundle branch block that we don't know whether it's new or old. They get rushed off to the cath lab, and next thing you know, the coronaries are clean, and they come back, and what they really have is sepsis. And we're now three to four hours behind the eight ball as far as getting our therapy initiated. We've recently become a level one trauma center. So many unconscious patients come in, they'll have a head laceration, and so they'll go down the trauma pathway, and again, two, three, or more hours later, they don't find any trauma, they transfer the patient to the medicine side of the ICU, and then we find out, wow, this patient's really septic, and we've missed a number of hours. And then we get a number of OD patients, overdose patients that come in, and unfortunately, many of them don't leave suicide notes, so we're, a lot of these are all presumed overdose patients. And one of the questions is, well, should we be doing a lumbar puncture on these patients? Again, the idea if you had a good cheap test with 100% negative predictive value that ruled out sepsis allows you to work up in the other areas and not worry about it.